Welcome to Awakened Titans Podcast with Lily Patrescu. Mind-blowing conversations with influential business titans sharing how you can manifest abundance, love, joy, success through quantum awakening, quantum manifestation, quantum healing, quantum miracles, exponential business growth, and innovative products and services. Discover how to build a nine-figure franchise business in today's session with John Hewitt. And he has two companies worth $500 million, and his companies were in the top 100 retail chains in the U.S., and he has personally created over 1,000 millionaires, and he has brought in 5,200 franchisees. So John founded Loyalty Brands in 2018, and he has grown it from zero brands to eight in six short years. The Loyalty Brands family includes Atex, Tax Service, Ledgers, The Inspection Boys, Zooming Grooming, Jumps and Staffing, Little Medical School, CR3 American Exteriors, and Loyalty Business Brokers. Each of these franchise concepts are easily knitted together to provide interested prospects and current franchisees a portfolio of businesses that are exciting for them to consider. Now, John, I have to say you are one of the most exciting guests I've had on this podcast. So my question is, what is the biggest secret to your success? Number one is drive. And when we started on this journey in 1982, H&R Block had 9,000 locations, and we bought a company with six, and we set out to add 8,995 offices and be number one in the industry. So it's, we were driven to be number one. Thank you. So how do you build a nine-figure franchise business? You know, this is my third time around. They say third time's a charm. It'll be my third company worth over $500 million, and the other two were public. And the key is, the most important thing is, if you have that goal, is that you have to get everyone to buy in. You have to get your investors, your employees, your vendors, your franchisees, your customers. Everyone has to believe in where you're going. So you have to have a fairly accurate vision and you have to have a group of believers. You have to get people to drink the Kool-Aid. Thank you. What should entrepreneurs do in order to create a successful nine-figure franchise business? You know, that's the number one question I've been asked in my career. And about a month ago, or six weeks ago, I thought to myself, you know, I've been asked that question a lot, and I always give the same answer. But in thinking about it, I said, you know what? I'm going to come up with, there's at least 10 things that are critical. There isn't just one thing. And I'm going to tell you the one key secret in a second. But I said, I'm going to do a webinar. And I did a webinar. It's on my website on how to build an incredible, successful business, an exponential company, one of the top 100 retail chains in the country. And it took me an hour. So I came up with, I love top 10 lists because of the Bible and the Ten Commandments. So in every one of my companies, we have, these are the top 10 most important things. So I came up with the 10 most important things that are required to have incredibly successful businesses. And it actually ended up being 12. And I think that's okay because in the top 10 college football, there's 14 teams in the Big Ten. So I have 12 of the top 10. But the number one key is perseverance. God doesn't put anyone on the planet to just skate through and and have an easy time. We're all face adversity. And the difference between winners and losers is the winners, they got to kill me to stop me. I always get up and keep going. Every time I get knocked down, every time I get humbled, I just get up and keep, keep going. Wow. That's an amazing tip. What about the other 11 tips? <laughs> Now, remember, it would take me over an hour to explain it, and I don't think we have all that time, right? I'll give you them without explanation, and you can delve into any you like, okay? Okay. One is integrity. You have to do what you say you're going to do. So few people on this planet say they're going to do something and really mean it. It's like the old handshake deal. So one is integrity. One is I always want what's best for every person, even if it's not best for me. 
then I always want what's best for each person that I deal with. Also, commitment to improvement. I'm fanatically committed to win. And to win, I'm fanatically committed to have the best system. To have the best system, it has to be improving. So commitment to improvement. Listening. Listening to employees. Most most CEOs have what I call CEO disease. They think they're supposed to know everything. And they're just wrong. I have, even after 55 years in business, I'm listening to my employees. I'm listening to my customers. And I talk to the people that are closest to the customer. So I listen to employees. I listen to what they tell me customers need and get them the tools they need. And that's a changing environment. Customers are looking for different things in 2024 than they did in 2019 or 2014 or 2010. People are looking for different things. So you got to listen. You have to have vision and it has to be fairly accurate. You have to have the pulse of the economy the, the and the industry. And you have to act accordingly. You have to, as I said earlier, you have to get buy-in from everyone. You have to learn to delegate. There's only so much I can do that on my own. If I was just one guy, I would never have built more than a $10 million company. And I built a billions of dollars worth of companies. It's everything worthwhile requires hard work. You have to work hard. And culture is incredibly important. I thought and I learned this, I didn't learn this until I was 40 years old, that what's the difference between the executives at Walmart and Kmart? One is extreme, one company is extremely successful and one company is going down the toilet. Well, what's the difference? Are they smarter, more educated, more experienced? No, you could hire smarter, most educated, more experienced. They are, it's the culture and the attitude of the leaders that set great companies apart. You have to have systemic. You have to have systems to resolve common issues. You can't face the same demon day after day, week after week. You have to have systems to solve common problems. So those are the 12 of my top 10 on what you have to do to have an exceptional, incredible company. Thank you so much. I think for a franchise, there's one really key aspect is sticking to certain standards and procedures. So what are the top 10 or top 12 things you recommend having in an SOP, in a standard operating procedure that most entrepreneurs miss out on? You mentioned before that we have a number of brands and we have a top 10 in all the brands, but the top 10 is different from in each brand. It's different in roofing than it is in tax, than it is in a little medical school. So, but one thing is key, and it comes down to this, that, and one of my favorite authors, Stan Phelps, wrote about this, and I love the way he said it. He said that you never arrive at a meeting exactly on time. You're either early or late. So if the meeting is 9 a.m., almost no one comes in exactly at the stroke of 9 a.m. It's either 8.59 or 8.54 or 9.02. And so he said in the same manner, you never, almost never meet a customer's expectations. You either exceed their expectations or fail to meet their expectations. So we judge our, I judge, we judge our growth and our success based on exceeding a higher percentage of customers' expectations each year. And that's how we value our performance, knowing we can never get to 100% times we're going to exceed a customer's expectations. But each year with each company, one thing is common. We have to exceed a higher percentage of customers' expectations. Wow, I love that. And what are the top mistakes entrepreneurs make when trying to build a successful franchise business? I've already made virtually every mistake you can make in this country. In the United States, there are no schools that teach you to be a CEO. I call it the school of hard knocks. I've been knocked down. And again, they say people, Peter Drucker, one of my favorite business authors, says people that are the most successful have made the, the most mistakes. So I think the, the biggest mistake I see is, and I talked about it a little bit before, is that people get too cocky. And they, some people 
even like to have yes men around. I believe that if you work for me, both of us think the same, Lily. One of us is useless. And I pick you because I'm the boss. So you need people that push you. I don't have enough time or energy, and I never have, to pull everyone along. I mean, I've had as many as tens of thousands of employees, and you just can't pull all those people along. You need leaders that are with you side by side that you have to hold back. And they don't like it, always like it. And I had one guy, one CFO that was so, he would get so angry. Then I agree with him 98, 99% of the time. I would rubber stamp what he said. But when I did it and I overruled it, boy, he said, you don't trust me and you don't this. And I said, if I rubber stamped everything that you said, I would be useless. I have to have an opinion and I have to do things differently. So the people don't, depend on others enough they think they're supposed to know it all and if i limit it to what i know then it's going to be incredibly less than what the group knows thank you what do you think separates those franchises that don't go very far and those that do yeah in 5200 franchisees that i i brought in a thousand became millionaires and a thousand failed and um, i i didn't learn this until during the journey. But my job is to give you the best system in the industry. I've been doing that for 55 years. Your job, if I do my job, is to follow that recipe, not to make the same mistakes that I've either made or seen. I've seen or made every mistake that you can possibly think of. So do not go down that path and make that same mistake. And yet, of the 5,200 people that I brought in, not one has ever listened to 100%. Zero, zippity doo So the thousand millionaires that I've helped create, they listen 98 or 99% of the time. I've also had a thousand people fail, and they listen less than 90% of the time. So in a franchise system, the most important thing is follow the recipe, follow the program, follow the system. It's the phrase I've used most in my whole life is just follow the system. And uh, it's human nature. If you have children, you understand that they don't listen. But even if you don't have children, you've been a child. So you understand you didn't listen to your parents every time you should have. People just are incapable of listening 100%. And I promise you, after being doing this for 55 years, if you don't listen to me, it's going to cost you time or money or both. Thank you. What, um, what, what I was going to ask you now. Um, yeah. Um, I had a really good question. <laughs> um, yes, I remember. I remembered. What were the biggest blind spots or lessons that you've had through the years? And what did you learn from them? Yeah, one of the dumbest things I did, ever did was when, remember, I talked earlier about we set out H&R Block in 1982 had 9,000 locations. And when we bought a company called Mel Jackson Tax Service, changed the name to Jackson Hewitt. And our goal was to have 9,001 location. And again, so I needed to open 8,995 offices. And we did pretty well. We bought it in August of, of 1982. In January, we had 11 locations. We went from six to 11. The next year we went to 15. And the third year, two and a half years later, we had uh, 22 locations. So that's pretty good growth in two and a half years to go from six to 22. But remember, our goal was to have 9,000. And I realized that if we're going from six to 11 to 15 to 22, I would be like a thousand years old by the time we got to 9,000 locations. So that wasn't going to work. So big mistake. We were had all company locations. And though H&R Block had been a, and been and is a franchise organization, I said, we got to start franchise. And then we grew exponentially. We went from 22 to 49 to 200 to 350 to 500. I mean, we grew exponentially by franchise. So one of the mistakes I made is not instituting franchising from day one when we first started. Thank you. And 
how do you manage to maintain this standard across all the franchisees? You know, that is incredibly important because in a franchise system, in any national system, whoever offers the worst service is going to determine the your brand is worth, the quality of your brand. Right? It's not going to be based on who's offering the best service. It's going to be limited by who's ever offering the worst service. So there's only one way to, Lily, there's only one way to determine if you're offering a good service. It doesn't matter if you think, or if you as a franchisee think you're doing a good job. It doesn't matter if I think you're doing a good job. It matters if the customer thinks they're doing a good job. So we do one thing that almost no company in any industry does. And this is across all of our brands. After A couple of days after they've been in, and whether it was getting their dog groomed or getting their tax return done or getting a new roof, a couple of days after we finish, we call each customer and ask how we did. And boy, the response is so gratifying because not only are most of them happy, but no one's calling people. They're emailing and texting and mailing and giving them a survey by hand. And almost no one's calling. So people people are tickled to get the question, how did we do for you and how can we improve? And so we get a higher retention rate. And Lily, I've learned in my career that in all my industries, my employees are not good at asking for referrals. You tell them to, you implore them, you tell them how important it is, you try to reward them for getting referrals, but people are too timid or too busy or whatever, mostly too timid to ask for a referral. So you get a very personable person on the phone call, talking to a customer. We say, how do we do for you? 95% say, wonderful. And say, do you know? Do you have any friends that could use our service? And you ask, you have this very personable person who makes the call, who is, that's their job, is to get referrals. And so your referrals jump up, your retention jumps up, and you find out how you're doing immediately instead of waiting six months, a year, two years, you find out right away who's doing the best job for you. So that's how we ensure we police our system. We call our customers. Thank you. How did you awaken to your titanic power and how did that realization help you to build this uh, nine-figure franchise business? That's been developing ever since I was a kid. You know, I've always had this, um, uh, somehow, I don't know, can never remember not being self-confident. And um, back when I was a kid, it might have been considered more cocky than self-confident. You know, I have my oldest son, I tell him, son, you're just as cocky as me, but I've earned it. So along the way, I earned it. You have to do what you say you're going to do. Anyone could say, I'm going to win. I'm going to be number one. I'm going to build a great business. I'm going to get rich. I'm going to make you rich. I mean, you have to do what you say you're going to do. So I just made that a practice. I have the old school, the handshake school, the f fanatical. If I make a pledge to you that this is going to happen three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now, then I am fanatically committed to it. Now, at least 95% of the world just says it. The best salespeople I've ever seen just say things. And whether it comes true or not, they don't care. I mean, think of it every, I don't know how the politicians are in your country, but in my country, there's never been a politician who said he was going to do something that did it. And great salesmen are the same same way with it like if they you acquire a franchise you're going to do this and do that and you're going to achieve this and achieve that um i i am fanatically committed to do what i say i'm going to do always always have been the you know the name of my book is i compete i'm a competitor i'm a lifelong competitor they got to kill me to stop me wow very and how can entrepreneurs awaken to their titanic power so they can also build a nine-figure franchise business. Yeah, that's, you know, there's, in, in uh, one of my companies, I, I sold it for half a billion, it became a billion dollar company. So I found, I'm one of less than 10,000 people in the United States that have 
founded a billion dollar company. So if you think that in the history of the United States, there's been over a billion people and less than 10,000 have started a, a um, uh, dollar business. It's a, you're going to have to be one out of one out of a million people to be able to do that. So you, you need, remember I went through the 10 attributes? You're going to have to live and learn. No one, no one starts from birth being able to develop a billion dollar company, right? You have to learn along the way. And you have to be a student of business and of growth to be able to do that. I mean, whether you're the greatest basketball player of all time or the greatest business person of all time, whether you're a Elon Musk or Michael Jordan, I mean, it requires an incredible amount of work. When I was a kid, I would have given any, almost anything to be first baseman on the New York Yankees. But I soon lost my um, appetite for all the work it would take, all the, all the thousands and thousands of hours I would need to play baseball and practice baseball and to, to do that. So I don't know if I've ever could have done it. I assume I probably couldn't, uh, limitations as, as the amount of time spent. But what I've seen, and the experts say, that and it's and and I kind of believe this that to be a credible a successful, you need to spend ten thousand hours in that whatever it is, whether it's an uh, athletic athletic achievement, a business achievement, uh, kind of achievement, a uh, singing career, uh, whatever. You have to spend ten thousand hours, so it requires an intense preparation. Is more important. You can't have success without pre pre preparation. Wow, that's so fascinating. So what's your message to um, entrepreneurs worldwide? Yeah, I when people approach us and, you know, I brought in 5,200 franchisees, that means over 500,000 have approached us and said and shown interest because about one out of every 100 people that approach us becomes a franchise. So and I, we take them through several steps. Number one is, should you be an entrepreneur? 70% of Americans want to be an entrepreneur. Turns out, from what I've seen bringing in 5,200, at least 1,000 of them should never have been an entrepreneur. They just don't have the risk-taking or the get-up-and-go, uh, the drive to be an entrepreneur. So first of all, should you be an entrepreneur? You have to make that decision and prove it. Obviously, if you've already done it, you've proven. Secondly, it, what industry should you be in? You need to pick something you enjoy. Life's too short. On Monday morning, if you're going to work and you're not looking forward to it, you're going to the wrong place. It's not, thank God, it's Friday. It's, thank God, it's Monday. So you need to find uh, something you love that makes it, thank God, it's Monday. If you're in a, thank God, it's Friday world, you're not being all you can be. You're missing. I've never, once I found out what I wanted to do when I started working for H&R Block when I was 20 years old, I've never worked a day since. I mean, it's all fun. I just enjoy. So you have to find something you like, you enjoy. And then, so you have to, ha you should be an entrepreneur. You have to find the right industry that you enjoy. Then you have to have, then it has to be the right time. I mean, it, whether it's a, a limitation of money whether you have a, any sicknesses or health issues, your family does, or you have, you have uh, limitations that are physical or, or um, their relatives. So it has to be the right time. And then you have to write, have the right vehicle. Because sometimes, it, I mean, in, in, in many things, for example, in restaurants, there are a hundred different restaurant chains right and and should you be an app should you be in if you, if that's your your love should you be in applebee's or mcdonald's or burger king or morton's or i mean which which vehicle is right for you so so it comes down to should you be an entrepreneur right industry right vehicle right time thank you so much for this very insightful interview and we'll see you in the next episode thank you lily
Follow us for more interviews with world's most influential business titans, providing you with the insights to awaken to your full potential, so you can get paid to be yourself, find true happiness, and manifest anything you desire.